Now, with no further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Jim Ski, our keynote speaker. Obviously, Jim does not need um, an introduction. He is a world-renowned expert in sustainable energy at Imperial College London. Jim is also the co-chair of Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on Mitigation of Climate Change, whose report was published earlier this year. And he's also the chair of Scotland's Just Transition Commission since 2018. Jim, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Okay, th thank you very much, Mariam. And, and thanks also for this opportunity to speak at, uh, speak at your conference. I was actually reminded by Amanda's introductory remarks that in a previous life I'd partnered with the Geneva Association on an EU framework project uh, when Walter Stehel uh, was there. So it's very good to continue this association. I think that was actually a long time ago, about the 25 year mark. So if I can get my, my first slide up, uh, what I'm going to do, I mean, obviously, as the introduction said, I'm co-chair of the mitigation part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But in the next few minutes, I will try to convey some of the key messages from all of the three working group reports of IPCC that have come out over the last year. So without more ado, straight on to the next slide and the outcomes of our colleagues in Working Group 1 who deal with the physical science of climate change and a very strong statement that really summarises everything that, that was uh, covered in that very comprehensive report. I think the key thing is the use of the word indisputable. It is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts more frequent and severe. We can observe climate change having an impact in every range, in every region of Earth, and these changes can only increase with further warming, which is inevitable. So very, very strong messages uh, from Working Group One. Uh, moving on, uh, the key, a, a key summary of where we are, this is a, a graph taken from the Working Group 3 report that came out in April, but it's also very much echoed by the UNEP GAP report, uh, which uh, the United Nations Environment Programme published last week, same kinds of messages, and also they were there in Mariam's in, in, introductory remarks. If we carry on with the current policies that we have in place, that is the reddish band at the top of the diagram, then emissions will be higher in 2030 than they are today. In order to limit global warming to one and a half degrees, which is the aspiration of the Paris Agreement, we would need to be on that blue line, which implies, uh, you, again, that emissions would need to fall by 43% by 2030 to put us there. If we were to be at the upper end of the Paris Agreement range, say likely to limit warming to two degrees, then we would need to be on that uh, green band, which requires emission reductions of about 27%. But the truth is the pledges that we have at the moment, the nationally determined contributions, lead to only a very small reduction by 2030 that would place 1.5 degree warming beyond reach, but it would still be possible to limit likely warming to two degrees, but only if we accelerate our emission reductions after 2030. And it is quite noticeable that the rate of reduction in that delayed action scenario where we stick to the current NDCs by 2030, the emission reductions year on year are actually higher than they are in that 1.5 degree scenario at the bottom. So it's emphasizing the importance of immediate action if we're going to avoid some of the challenges, both in terms of feasibility and cost uh, for reaching our emission targets. Now, this uh, figure has important implications for both adaptation and mitigation. So if we can move to the next slide, which is from Working Group 2, our, our colleagues who work on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. Again, just a very set of high level messages about what would need to happen uh, to address the challenges suggested by the previous slide. We need political commitment and follow through at all levels of government. 
For adaptation, institutional frameworks are particularly important. As suggested by Amanda, we need clear goals, we need priorities, and we need defined responsibilities. We need to spread the knowledge of potential climate change impacts and the risks associated with these impacts in order to improve our responses. We need to expand that knowledge, spread it throughout society. And benchmarking, monitoring and evaluation of adaptation measures are essential to track progress. And you cannot do that monitoring and evaluation unless you've got set plans against which you can measure yourself. And inclusive governance it, climate impacts are going to affect all kinds of populations around the world, so inclusive governance that prioritises equity and justice are going to be extremely important to get the buy-in for the kind of changes that may be necessary. I should add that finance is also important. I'm going to come back to that before, before we, we finish the presentation. Now, turning to the, the mitigation uh, side of, of the question, uh, our reports cover all sorts of systems, energy, agriculture and land use, transport, cities, etc. I'll just focus on the energy system at the moment in the, in the interests of time. And the very clear messages that echo previous reports, we need major, tran not just transitions, but transformations to limit global warming to the kind of levels implied in, in the, in the uh, Paris Agreement. It means big reductions in fossil fuel use, especially if it is not abated with technology, and the step up of carbon capture and storage systems will be extremely important to put us on the right target. We need to move to low or no carbon energy systems, and it is, it is uh, very clear that the kind of reductions that we've seen in renewable energy costs over the last five to ten years are indicating where the possibilities are, because renewables can compete with fossil fuels on an even level playing field in many parts of the world at this point. Electrification of final energy demand, including in the transport sector and for heating our buildings, will be extremely important to take advantage of low or zero carbon electricity and obviously improved energy efficiency, which is uh, really a win on all counts. It reduces costs for consumers, it reduces emissions, and you can create new jobs uh, at the same time by investing in more efficient homes. And finally, we'll find electricity won't do absolutely everything. So there are other technological solutions associated with other kinds of energy carriers where it may be difficult for electricity to get there. So, for example, hydrogen may have certain applications, for example, for freight transport and sustainable biofuels will also be important in, in some parts of the world. If we could move it, move it on, I just wanted to flag also that it's not just all about technology. And for the first time, an IPCC report did actually address the question of the people side of climate change mitigation, looking specifically at energy, energy and other kinds of demand, also looking at the food system. And this made a very clear point that it is possible to satisfy people's needs for nutrition, shelter and mobility while bringing global emissions down by 40 to 70% through demand side measures. Uh, so it's got a list of the kind of things there that we've got, walking and cycling, electrified transport, reduced air travel, adapting houses. But and I would flag, it's not on this slide, but it's implicit in the, in the uh, little picture on the bottom left hand side. We also address the important question of diets and, and, and food systems, delicately I should say, but we, we did approach it. So a very clear message that lifestyle changes, if they're going to place, require systemic changes across society. People won't do it by themselves. They'll only do it if they're supported by the availability of infrastructure and the availability of technology that allows them to make these changes. So the question of human behavior and technology are a little bit indivisible. They need to be thought about at the same time. 
On a final point, we were well aware of the fact that in some parts of the world, there is a need for more energy access and that well-being can only be promoted by giving people additional access to housing, energy and resources. But it was very clear that that did not need to compromise efforts to reach long-term climate targets. Now, the, the almost, almost uh, the next slide, please. The, um, one point that I really do need to make very strongly, and it wasn't on the adaptation slide, is the absolute importance of finance as an enabling condition for the kind of changes that we need. And we actually wanted to put this very striking diagram showing the difference between current investment flows and those investment flows that would be needed by 2030 we wanted to put that into summer, our summary for policymakers. Unfortunately, it fell apart because countries disagreed as to whether we could refer to developed or developing countries or, or not. But fortunately, it's still there in our technical summary and we can raise it up and show it in our diagrams. But the big, big message from that is that investment flows fall far short of the levels needed in order to pursue the objectives of the Paris Agreement around both emissions reduction and reducing, reducing vulnerability. So big messages. At the top, we look at uh, the, the gaps in flows by different sector. And one thing to flag is there are certainly still gaps on the electricity side that are existing. But actually, because of the economics of renewable energy in particular, financial flows there are starting to move in the right direction. And although the gaps are big, they are not as big as in other areas, for example, energy efficiency, transport. And we would particularly emphasize, I think, the question of investment in agriculture, forestry and other land use as a very, very big gap in terms of multiples uh, needed in terms of scaling up. And I think the second message uh, there is that the gaps are far bigger in developing countries than they are in developed countries. So getting flows to the more vulnerable parts of the world will be ab absolutely critical. And the final point, because this came from the mitigation report, uh, it, it focuses on mitigation investments. But one other point that I think we should emphasize because of collaboration between our co with our colleagues in Working Group 2 on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, even speaking as a Working Group 3 mitigation co-chair, I can flag up that the gaps for adaptation funding are actually far larger than they are for, for uh, mitigation. We can get markets in mitigation that can help to move financial flows. It's very difficult to see markets in adaptation where the benefits are more often realised in a particular place. And I think that is a particular challenge that we face going forward. So if we could just move to my final and uh, very, very simple slide. And I think, uh, you know, the fact that we have not seen much movement in the nationally determined contributions uh, in the run up to COP27, there's a very clear message that the time for action is now. Action is extremely urgent and that urgency is there for adaptation because it looks as though we will be going to higher levels of warming. But it's also there for mitigation, because regardless of whether we limit warming to 1.5 degrees or not, uh, it is essential that we step up mitigation efforts to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So I, I hope in sort of around 15 minutes or a little less, I've managed to summarise 9,000 pages of IPCC reports <laughs> and just say it in just a few words. So th thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jim, for, for that summary and reminder of what science and evidence is telling us. And I think what is striking, and we just need to keep emphasize, is the scale and scope of transformation that needs to happen in such a short period of time for us to have any chance of aligning ourselves with, with recommendations of IPCC. Now, at the Geneva Association, we work with a pretty extensive network of experts from insurance industry and, and other sectors. I, I'd like to invite uh, one of my colleagues, Ernst Reich, who is the Chief of Climate at Munich Re and a very active member of Geneva Association Working Group on Climate Change and Environment, 
to ask a question. And to the other audience uh, that are participating, please feel free to send your questions by clicking on Q&A and send your questions for Jim in writing and for other panelists as we proceed. Uh, Ernst, are you there? The floor is yours. Okay, I we may have a technical difficulty. I know that he's online. Well, let me proceed uh, just to start the questions. So, uh, Jim, COP27 is around the corner and we know how we are going into it. What are your hopes in terms of achievements uh, during this event, not only through negotiations, but discussions at the periphery? And what do you see as the top two or three enabling factors to incentivize this massive transformation uh, for economic decarbonization? How are we going to move to action meaningfully and do it quickly? Yeah, yeah, and, and of course, COP27 has been characterized as an implementation COP. It's a little bit different from the Glasgow one in, in COP26. So I think getting movement and actually putting in place the aspirations that were that came from the Glasgow Pact, I think, are, are really important. I mean, the, the areas that I would flag up, uh, I mean, I can obviously uh, talk about the nationally determined contributions on the mitigation side. We have not seen much progress. Uh, you, you know, since COP26, and we could cross our fingers and hope that people have come up with more. Personally, I'm a little bit sceptical that that's actually going to, going to happen at this stage, which then brings into firm focus the very difficult conversations that are going to take place about loss and damage. What happens about adapting to climate change and what about compensation for the residual risks that will be left when limits to adaptation have been reached? And I think there are some very, very difficult conversations going to take, take place there. And I, I think that that in, indeed would, would be extremely important. And in, term, in terms of the, you know, the kind of the enabling factors to make it all happen, uh, money, 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 uh, makes the world go round and will keep the world spinning, I think. So I think this question of finance is absolutely critical. It's important to remember that there were three goals in the Paris Agreement. One was around mitigation and getting emissions down. One around enhancing uh, uh, re resilience to climate change. And the third one about making the money flow in order to allow these other objectives do, to be met. And I think progress on the financing side is, is also going to be one of the critical factors. And since you asked me for two, I need to get another one in. So let me just put political will onto the agenda as well. This, this is, this is uh, absolutely essential to move forward. Excellent. There's another question from the audience. Do you believe international climate agreements sufficiently address the role of banks and the financial sector in moving towards sustainable economic growth and the transition? Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily expect uh, individual sectors uh, you know, to be singled out in the in kind of things like uh, like the Paris Agreement, for example. But you know, when when you go to a COP, as I am doing ne next Monday, you know, it's a mixture of a negotiation a trade fair for all kinds of sectors uh, of the economy. It's a scientific congress and it's a, a demonstration for, you know, from, from people from civil society. It's all of these things at once. And I do think it's incredibly important that all sectors, especially people involved in the financial sector, are engaged with all the negotiations and all the peripheral discussions that go around the outside as well. Absolutely essential. Excellent. Um, there is just one last question. Maybe we just have a quick answer to that by Adam Mohammed from our audience. What are top mitigation and adaptation solutions that can be implemented uh, for the private sector? Just maybe some quick thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, ju just in terms of the of, of the mitigation options. I mean, promoting renewable energy, and if if it works in certain places, other forms of zero carbon energy will be absolutely critical. Uh, the one that stands stands up is energy efficiency in buildings. This is so obvious as something to, to you to get on with, and it could pay for itself. Essentially, you, you, you know, essentially. 
And I think the other side is probably the transportation end, end of it as well. And there are both behavioural and technological elements associated that uh, with, with electrification. Thank you so much, Jim. In this very busy time where your expertise is of such high demand, just before um, you know the negotiations uh, take place over the next two weeks, we are grateful that you spent some time with us in this conference and shared some of your insights. Best of wishes in the discussions to you and all of us next week, and thank you again for joining us in this conference.